Welcome, everybody, to the Retirement Success in Maine podcast. My name is Ben Smith, and allow me to introduce the Aroostook County potato to my Hancock County lobster, Curtis Wister. How are you doing today, Curtis? All right. I'm doing well, Ben. Doing well. How are you? Good. I, I thought you were going to take a little slight to being referred to a potato and that I, I get know. The lobster. I know. But, but that's okay. I don't eat lobster and we know this. So. I, that's why I, I did that. I, I, I knew your anti seafood, <laughs> you know, it, you know, anything has to be on land, not off. That's so, right. I was like, if I'm going to choose a food, I better do something that is like grown right in the ground. That's right. Right. That's right. Well, well, so we, we've been covering lots of things and, and one thing that we, we wanted to cover and I, I had the, the privilege of being introduced to today's guest mm-hmm. um, is this idea of, you know, we work, uh, we're, we're going along in our lives and sometimes something happens to us medically, right? Sometimes there's a shock and there's something that just causes our life to maybe just take a, take a bit of a change or a pause or, or maybe a little bit of a timeout. And that, that's what we wanted to get to today because, you know, disability is something that many Americans, especially younger people think that can only affect the lives of other people, right? Is that, that's sure. not going to be me, sure. you know, that's going to be, you know, somebody else out there. And tragically, thousands of young people are seriously injured or killed, often as a result of traumatic events. Many mm-hmm. serious medical conditions, such as cancer or mental illness, and we've covered mental illness a lot in this show, right, is talking about okay. that, can affect the young as well as the elderly. And the sobering fact for 20-year-olds is that more than one in four of them become disabled before reaching retirement age. And that's a Social Security Administration disability fact. And from the state of Maine, because again, we got a little Maine focus here right. uh, from congressional statistics in 2021 from SSA is we in the state of Maine have 50,945 disabled workers that are currently receiving social security benefits. Mm. And nationally, as of June, 2022, 12.3 million Americans are disabled and receiving social security, supplemental social security income or both. Yeah. And according to the American Bar Association, over 5% of the workforce today is receiving SSI benefits. So those are some statistics about becoming disabled. But what is life really like when that happens to us? How do we reinvent who we are and what Mm. provides us purpose now that our life has changed to a change in our health status? So that is the purpose of today's show. That's right. And, you know, as you said, Ben, we have a great guest uh, for today's show. So. Our next guest was a high school junior when his father, the radio newsman, asked him to babysit for his boss at the radio station. (laughs) He assumed it was to babysit the boss's kids, but it was uh, to run the actual news show. So the radio station played the local church services from the previous week and no one wanted the job. So and from by the way, that, can you imagine like you're 17? Holy God. And someone says, here you go. Here's a radio show. Good knock yourself out. I know. I know. So from that moment, our guest knew uh, what he wanted to do as a career and has been a broadcaster for 33 years. So at the height of popularity for radio uh, stations and DJs in the 70s and 80s, our guest blazed the trail for himself as Kid Curry. His iconic bad check segment helped propel him to star status in Miami, and it followed him during his over 20 year path to the dream job of major market program director. So the perks of the job, including hanging out with musical legends, being invited uh, to the White House, meeting Johnny Yu and a Watergate burglar, uh, traveling around the world uh, to find the next number one song, and the best part, helping listeners in need. So life was on track for our guest, uh, but multiple sclerosis had other plans. So our guest dismissed the early signs of the disease and continued with his optimistic outlook until a fateful round of golf led uh, to the diagnosis that halted a lifelong career and extinguished his dreams. Um, But, you know, attitude is everything. And, you know, we've had shows on this in our podcast series about attitude and gratitude and, and, you know, with the love and support of his incredible wife and her assurance of we got this poppy our guest embraced his new challenge and shows us that life can be good even in the face of adversity so after eight years of failing health uh, modern science gave him hope by halting the progression of the disease 
and he's here to tell his story with us. So at this time, please welcome Kim Kid Curry to the Retirement Success in Maine podcast. Kim, thank you so much for coming on our show today. Curtis and Ben, thank you very much. I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Yeah, well, well we're excited to get to know you a little bit, Kim, and uh, hear a little bit about you know, again, you, you you have lots of really exciting things that, that you've done in your life, and we want to hear all about that. But again, we really want to dig into kind of this, hey, here's a moment where you, where your health changes and, and how yeah. do you reinvent and how do you kind of re, um, realign uh, some things in your life that and kind of get through to the other side of that. So we want to talk about all that, but we always start our shows with kind of getting to know you a little bit uh, first, Kim. So the first thing we'd love to hear about Again, we gave a little bit of the intro to you uh, kind of getting that first babysitting, I'm using air quotes, <laughs> job, <laughs> right, about uh, becoming a radio broadcaster. Can you tell us a little about that life story and kind of how you became a radio broadcaster and kind of letting, leading into your career? Well, what you mentioned, the radio station, there was only one in town. Um, mm. I lived in a very small town here in Colorado. In fact, it's the home of the Colorado State Penitentiary. Not that that matters in this particular case. But uh, huh. so there was one radio station there. My father was a retired uh, Navy veteran, spent 20 years in the Navy and a Korean War veteran. Uh, he retired and he, he, his last station was in Pueblo, Colorado. And his job was to be the recruiter for the Navy in Pueblo, which to me, I thought was always crazy because we're in the middle of the prairie in Pueblo. They were recruiting for the Navy. But over the three years he was at that station, he interviewed kids from all around the region. And uh, when I finally went to go writing my memoir, I asked my mother, I said, Mom, why did Dad decide to move us to Canyon City, which is a little town about 30 miles to the west of Pueblo, which is where he was stationed? And my mom simply said, well, he always said the smartest kids come from Canyon. And uh, so all the kids that were being interviewed to get into the Navy, he thought the smarter ones were from Canyon. And that's why he picked that little town. And uh, so, you know, you, you, you talked about me being 17 years old, having to play the God show on Sunday mornings. Uh, that was the radio station that none of my friends listened to. That radio station was designed for all of our parents. And believe me, even having a job there was, you know, a shot to my persona. Mm. Uh, but it did what mattered. It, uh, the first time I heard my voice on the radio, I knew that's what I wanted to do. I had been a high school trumpet player. Uh, I was in the plays. I was I play. I was Linus in You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. Uh, so I had done acting and 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 been on uh, and 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 it was my thing. I could tell that entertainment show business was what I wanted to do. So that got me started. Uh, and then two and a half years later, I had been to the University of Southern Colorado. At the time, it was called Southern Colorado State College, and mm -hmm. now it's a part of this Colorado State University system. Mm -hmm. But it was in Pueblo. And I went there to, to minor, I mean, to, to major in music and to minor in broadcasting. But, you know, when you're a little guy, a little boy, 17 years old, and you're on the radio and girls are calling to hear their favorite songs, hey, DJ, could you play my song? It was much more cool for me to be a DJ than it was to be a trumpet player in the college orchestra. I could imagine why, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but for the two years that I was there to studying the, uh, in the broadcasting classes, I was really turned on by the research that we did, listening to radio stations all around the country, trying to decipher what made better top 40 stations uh, than other top 40 stations. What was so, why was it so good in, in New York that WABC was so strong? Why was it in LA where KHJ, why were they the heroes? Why were they the leading station? So in that research, we stumbled onto some radio stations in Miami, Florida. There were two FM radio stations that were battling. Now, I don't know, you guys probably aren't even old enough to remember this, <clears throat> but there was a time when uh, there was really not even any current music on FM radio. The only thing people listened to was AM radio. Hmm. And the, the FM radio was, was for the hippies that they'd get on the radio and they'd, they'd play all these songs in a row and then they'd go, well, and then before that we heard and... Before that, we heard. <laughs> so it was really, really laid back. But there was yep. so there came a time when Top 40 Radio went from being on the AM dial, the WABCs, the KHJs, the, the bigger AM stations in America, and that format went to the FM dial. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Now, the FM dial is a very, it's a very clean frequency. You listen to it, you know that AM radio is scratchy. FM sounds very, very clear. Sure. Hmm. So it was a new thing in the business in the early 70s to take top 40 music and put it on FM radio stations. One of the early ratings battles in America was between these two radio stations in Miami. And when I was in college, we would sit there, we, people would, they would re record the radio stations and send them around to, to all the radio station, uh, college stations and things. So we would all listen to them and break them apart. But Miami was different. You know, it's different in general. All of us who've been there know Miami's not mm -hmm. like every place else. Very, very Latin American leaning. Mm -hmm. It's a very, well, at the time, though, you got to remember uh, in the 70s, uh, the big boat lift uh, hadn't happened. I mean, the, the, the escape from Cuba didn't really happen until much later in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So when mm -hmm. I got there in the 70s, it was very, very much Miami Vice. Now, I'm sure you might have seen the, the movie, mm -hmm. but the TV show <laughs> sure. was the real thing. I mean, mm -hmm. it was really, it was hardcore. So I, I'm a little radio guy. My first full-time job is in Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm there for six months and I start sending out audition tapes and I get a job offer in Miami. So okay. within six months of leaving my college, I was in Miami playing real radio on what at that time was the biggest FM radio battle on top 40 in America. Very cool. So, and, and that's really where my career started and it's where my career ended. And we can get into that whenever you're ready. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. It, well I, I guess what I'd like to hear a little bit about uh, Kim is kind of this, what was, what was kind of the progression of, Hey, this is what I wanted to get into was becoming a broadcaster, right. And, and being on the radio, being a DJ and kind of that, what was, what was the progression of is, is kind of like that the pinnacle and you go, that's kind of what we really want to do, or, Hey, this is where I'm going in my career and it continues to build skills and develops and becomes more of a, you know, a market leader and kind of where, where does that go? Well, when I got into the business, there was, remember only actually four television networks, mm -hmm. including PBS, CBS, ABC, and NBC mm -hmm. and then PBS. And so you didn't have all this, all these other social, uh, all this other input, all this mm -hmm. other uh, media coming at you from all these different directions. So to it, in those days, radio was at the bottom of the entertainment totem pole. You could be a radio DJ, you could be on TV, or you could be doing movies. So DJ was at the bottom of the list. But remember, there was a time when all the movie stars were first radio DJs. Look at Ronald Reagan. Right. Uh, yeah. All the old, uh, all the old guys who ended up, uh, you know, Burns and Allen were, that was a radio show before it became a TV show. So it was a natural progression. I wanted to be in show business and I was on the radio. So my intent eventually was uh, to become a radio programmer. That means I was not just a DJ. I was going to be able to design the radio station and try to win ratings with my ideas mm -hmm. and then eventually make it to television. But of course, the radio career goes up and down. I ended up uh, in Miami for a, uh, at, at three of the most influential stations in Miami over the first 10 years of my career. Uh, the first place I went to was called 96X. Uh, that was the number two station in that one-two battle I was telling you about. Yeah. The number one radio station was called Y100. And when I say these names, I guarantee you there are people going to be watching this and go, I know that because these, <laughs> these stations have been longtime historic stations in South Florida. So for the first 10 years I was in Miami, I worked for the three primary top 40 stations. I got my education from two very smart radio program directors, and I left Miami to go to San Antonio to be a program director at KTSA. Once again, People who know San Antonio and you say KTSA, they'll say, oh, yes, I know that because it was a legendary station for many, many decades back when AM was strong. Mm -hmm. But I bounced around, went up to my, after I left San Antonio, I went up to Washington, D.C. And then I was in Baltimore. Then I went back to Miami. So my radio career went like this all around mm -hmm. the country. I learned a lot. I enjoyed the show business part of it. Got to meet all sorts of, of incredible people, had all sorts of incredible experiences. But through that time, through these years, 
through the 20 years before my MS really kicked in, where I, when I realized something was wrong, I was having exacerbations. I thought at one time I had been bitten by fire ants because uh, my, mm. my vision started to, to dim. My, mm. my arms started to really hurt. My hand curled up and then it stopped. And then life went on and I thought, oh, I've been stung by a killer bee. One time I thought, why am I acting like this? Why, are, why don't my feet feel normal? My toes would curl up. And I thought, well, I must have been hit by a, by a killer bee. Mm. And then there was one time, the one time that is, uh, that's actually in my memoir, that's one of my favorite stories. I was in Washington, D.C., and you, you mentioned earlier about a segment on my show called Bed Check. Mm -hmm. Now, I was the nighttime radio DJ, so my, uh, my job was to gather all the high school and middle school kids. That was my rating source. So I was always at high schools. I was always at career days and things like that at schools. And so I had this segment for the last five minutes of my radio show It's called bed check. And I'd let people call in and say whatever they wanted. They could make a joke about a teacher. They could rip on their friend. Uh, they could sing if they wanted to, whatever they wanted to do. And I would fire back some sort of smart, a DJ remark. Okay. So this was a very big segment for the markets that I was in, in, in Washington, DC, it became political. Instead of it being a, a little high school kid thing, I was getting political comments and having parties go at each other and saying hmm. things. Hmm. And so I just thought that was funny. And it really kind of helped me expand my, my entertainment. You know, I, I became really funny at that point, many people say, <laughs> because it gave me fodder, really good sure. fodder. Yeah. But, but I had this one guy call me and he said, hey, my name's Frank DeFramer. I'm over here at the White House and the president's in here listening to bed check right now. And he thinks you're funny. And because this was a feature and I thought people were just calling and making stuff up, I ha 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 ha. And I went to the next call. Well, this continued to happen for the next two or three weeks. This guy, Frank DeFramer on the phone here, president was just in my office. He says he thinks you're funny. And I'm yeah, OK, sure. Mm. But after it happened four or five times, I really started to wonder. So when he called, I stopped the show, took him off, and I said, hello, who are you and what are you saying? He said, well, I, my, I am Frank DeFramer. Uh, I am the guy who, who uh, does all the maintenance on the frames in the White House. Somebody has to maintain the frames at the White House, and that's my job. I'm in the Secret Service. Uh, my, uh, that's what I do. And the president is often down in my shop, and he listens to your bed check, and he loves your show. Hmm. So. That was just something that just happened one time. Awesome. And I, you know, I felt that was kind of cool. It was actually <coughs> just after Reagan's assassination attempt. Hmm. Okay. So I want to, now we're going to forward. I left Washington, DC and I go up to Baltimore. I have a girlfriend, uh, her, her girlfriend brings my, my girlfriend brings her grandmother into town. I tell her this story about, Oh yeah, the president listened to me when I was in Washington, DC. And she says, well, then you get to take me to the White House. And I was like, <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> I wish I would have brought that up. Uh, well, if you know somebody over there, you can take us. Oh, okay. So I, I picked up the phone. And remember, I had, this was just a telephone conversation between me and Frank DeFramer. It really sure. wasn't. I didn't know if it was real still. Sure. But I had to call the White House. And I'm like, uh, yeah, can I speak to um, Frank DeFramer? And they're like, oh, Frank, yeah, hang on. I'll be right there. And, oh, man, there really is a Frank DeFramer. <laughs> so he gets on the phone and I tell him, Frank, you know, uh, first he was mad that I left Washington, D.C. He, he couldn't <laughs> hear me when I was in Baltimore. But, uh, he, you know, I told him that you know, my girlfriend's grandma's here. She wants to come and tour the White House. Uh, I, can I get it? He says, listen, whatever, you, just come on over. Whenever you want to come over, just tell them. I'll let, I'll let them Secret Service guy know when you're coming and they'll all be ready for you. Just tell them, come and see Frank DeFramer and you're in, no problem. So hmm. I, I go to the White House and I'm driving around the White House. Remember, it's just after the assassination attempt, but they had not shut down security at the White House. So I'm going around and there are two or three different roads that head into the complex. I saw one that looked like it went right straight to the side of the building. So I said, well, okay, here I go. So I'm driving down there. And as I'm driving, right as I start in, you know, it starts to happen. Men start coming out with guns drawn, rifles drawn. Now, what we know about multiple sclerosis, it is absolutely stress affected. Mm. At that point, while I'm sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, am I going the wrong way? Is this, is this? Suddenly I start losing vision in my right eye. 
Oh my my, my right arm starts to curl up and my legs seize and they stick straight out and I can hardly stop the car and they're getting closer and closer and they're yelling freeze freeze and all I could think to do is open the door and all I could do was fall out of the car. Oh so my I goodness. fall out of the car and I'm yelling, I'm here. It's Kid Curry. I'm here for Frank the Framer. And they're all like, hey, kid, what's up? That <laughs> scared me to death. In fact, right now, as I'm telling you this story, my legs are seizing. Mm. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's mm. what happens with multiple sclerosis. It's mm. an adrenaline thing. It's a stress thing. So wow. through my life, I had these stress things that happened to me that were exacerbations of multiple sclerosis. So weave my whole radio career, the fun I was having, the the rating shares we were gaining and, and, and through all that, every now and then something like that would happen. Mm. So uh, I was, um, remember the, there was a, a tsunami. Uh, it was somewhere around 2004 or so. Uh, we, really the first tsunami we got to see on television because remember you, they, we actually got to see parts of that world just be taken over by water and, and people, animals houses just flown back in the tsunami. We'd never seen that before. I was at my mother's house here in Colorado on vacation with my wife and my kids. And my mother starts looking at me thinking, there's, you look funny. What's wrong with your face? Uh, I said, mom, you know, it's just this tsunami. I'm on vacation. Uh, I, I have a stressful life. I'm trying to calm down. And she says, no, there's really something wrong with you. When you get back to Miami, I want you to go to the doctor. Mm. So that was where the golf game came in. Um, mm. I, I had, I was living on, uh, across from the seventh hole on Don Shula's golf course in Miami. And I would, uh, just walk out my front door and go play golf whenever I wanted to at night and things like that. And I, I, in fact, I was a member. I used to play all the time. I was just getting into the part of my golf game where I could actually play in front of people. <laughs> and, uh, and all of a sudden, man, I swung one time. It was a, it was a drive. It was on the second hole. And everything in my back just seized up. I had electrical charges going through my legs. And that's what got me to the doctor, knowing that, yeah, my mom's right. There really is something wrong. Uh, but as is with multiple sclerosis, you are not diagnosed immediately. There are a variety of tests that go on for weeks and weeks, probably six weeks of testing before the doctor finally decided what was going on. Mm. Um, and I was at my corporate office over in Naples, Florida, which is on the other side of the coast of Miami um, in, on the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, it was five o'clock, almost five. I was in this meeting with all my corporate geniuses and my phone rang and I picked it up and it was my doctor. And she says, uh, listen, I, I think I've come up with a diagnosis. Can you talk? And I said, hang on a second. I got it from the meeting and went into another room. And the doctor says, well, uh, you need to come in here on Monday uh, because I'm going to I'm going to diagnose you with multiple sclerosis. So yeah. you need to come here on Monday so you and I can talk about the rest of your life. Wow. Mm. And uh, it, <laughs> mm. that was a shocking moment. And, so sorry. Uh, so so from there. So you're right. You're getting that diagnosis. Um, so can you just kind of talk about how that and how it progressed into kind of forcing you into retirement from your radio career. Because I think that, you know, obviously our kind of through way with the show is retirement and adapting to, you know, these changes. So could you just talk about that and how it really forced you there into retirement? By the time I was diagnosed, uh, I'd been the program director of Power 96 uh, for about nine years. And we had the highest ratings in the history of the station. It was really going well. And it wasn't really my genius. I was handed a couple of, I was handed a big group of very smart broadcasters. I was just a different, or, I was just a different director, same orchestra, different director. And mm -hmm. it just worked out like crazy. So things were going very, very well for me right then. And uh, so it was, it was quite a shock. I can tell you that when I went back into the corporate office meeting, I, I said to them that I had just been diagnosed with MS. So I'm going home, packed up my bag and got in my car. But now I said I was over in Naples. So that's a three hour drive back to Miami. Mm -hmm. I got on the phone with my wife. And uh, for those three hours, we discussed what I had never even thought of was multiple sclerosis. I had no clue, didn't know what it was. Yeah. So she did the 2005 version of Google. And starts to read to me things that scared us both. 
Sure. We couldn't believe what we were reading. I mean, you can die from multiple sclerosis. And the fact that it has at that time was coming on me very strong. Like I said, my mother had noticed it. Uh, six months later, I'm having all these complications. My feet don't work right. My shoulders in serious pain. The golf thing happens. Mm. And so all of a sudden I could tell it was all exacerbations and coming down on me fast. I can tell you that it was a shocking conversation with my wife. And when I got home, um, we went, we knew that we had to go see the doctor on Monday. Yeah. I went into my corp. I went into the office that day on Monday, like a normal guy. Um, and just told him I've been diagnosed. I'm going to go see my doctor today and I'll be back tomorrow to let you know what, what's going on. And uh, when I came back into the office, I had already decided that I was going to, I was going to retire wow. uh, because my doctor told me that what was happening to me, you know, MS is lesions. Lesions occur on the brain. They occur in the spine and in the, in the neck. Uh, and these lesions, depending on where they land, is how your body is affected by multiple sclerosis. My lesions in my neck and in my head affect my lower two, three, three quarters of my legs. From my mid thigh down, I can't feel anything. Uh, they mm. seize all the time. My feet curl up. So mm. it really depends on where the lesions happen in your system. I also had a lesion somewhere in the middle of my uh, what do they call when you have vertigo, uh, mm. somewhere in the cortex of my brain, there was a vertigo problem. So it was tough guys. Uh, I, I was a normal guy. I was playing basketball, a full court basketball, golf, run the number one radio station in Miami, Florida. Uh, I had, my kids were mine. I, I was a single dad at the time. Everything was going very, very well for me. So I was, well, I was a single dad and then I got married to my wonderful wife. And three years after we got married is when I got diagnosed. So things were going very, very well for me. Mm. So, so the, can, can yes. I, can I, can I ask then yes. this whole, like, okay, so here we are, geez, like we're, we're kind of top of the world where we're feeling, you know, geez, I'm, I'm active, you know, you're, you're having symptoms, right. But you, you're kind of dismissing them because, well, geez, I'm, I'm otherwise top shape, right? I mean, I'm, I'm doing full court basketball. I'm, you know, playing 18 holes of golf, like, c come on, right? What's, what's the problem here? So I could see where all of a sudden you get this diagnosis in, you know, you and your wife are reading this um, 2005 uh, Ask Jeeves or whatever it might be, there, <laughs> right. you know, about what, what MS is and what that diagnosis really means. Can you talk about maybe the day of the week of where you're saying, Hey, you walk in and you, you retire at that point. How did you take that diagnosis in terms of, cause I could see where, and, and I know I'm not finishing my question just yet, but I could see where in that moment, it's very easy to look at yourself in self pity and uh, just kind of wallows in the depths of it. And, and really just go to maybe the bad place. Right. And how did you kind of, because, you know, just talking, hearing you talk and hearing you kind of even recount some of the things you've done, you have a lot of hope, you have a lot of optimism, you have a very positive attitude. So how did you take the diagnosis initially? How, as your, especially as your health is changing and how did you kind of maintain the optimism that, that you, you could still live the life that you wanted or, or maybe even a different way? Well, I can tell you that it was, it was shocking and it angered me. Um, in the, in the deep down of my soul, in fact, it was, you know, for eight years, I really didn't know if I was going to live. I mm -hmm. mean, I was, I was mad and it was killing me. And I was on steroid treatments to try to stop whatever lesions were appearing. Uh, there were, I was taking experimental medicines. My wife and I, my wife was doing everything she could to, to keep me above ground. Uh, she has never, uh, held back on making my life comfortable. I drive with hand controls and that's when we're going to get into it cost to be disabled in America. In America. Yeah, sure. But uh, so for eight years, I went from, you know, walking like a normal guy to a cane to crutches and then to a wheelchair in about two years. Uh, then I became desperate uh, with the, with the medicine they were trying to get me to take and and, and nothing was stopping, nothing was slowing anything down. I just kept getting worse and worse. Now, when I first got diagnosed, there were only four or five MS medicines. So the five years later, 
Six years later, there were the eight or nine medicines. So eight years into the progression that my, and, and, you know, you talk about, you asked about the mental state. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I have kids. MS became the only thing I could think about. That's why I knew I had to retire from the radio business because I, I lived and breathed radio. Those who know Kid Curry and the people that I've worked for and with, I am of a breed unlike today's radio broadcasters. I lived and breathed it 24-7 because guess what? Radio stations don't shut off. Mm-hmm. And when you're the guy in charge, that's your thing. And then when I got diagnosed within 48 hours, I was no longer thinking about the radio station. And that shocked me. Yeah. And that's when I told my wife, I don't even care what songs are playing. And that's not like me. I don't care if they're even promoting things correctly. That's not like me. So I knew I was done because all I could think about was what is this, what's going on and where is this going to end? Because it was all coming on real strong. And then, you know, my wife and I, you know, when I got diagnosed, I didn't realize that I was really concerned about income. I didn't know what, what kind of, what, what I was, what was going to happen. Yeah. But within the first week of me being diagnosed, the office manager that we had, um, who was, you know, we, her name is Phyllis, but you could call her Sergeant Phyllis. She ran the office. Uh, Phyllis came into me uh, within the first couple of days after my resignation, after the office tried to keep me on, no matter what, we'll give you a different position. I was like, no, I'm going. She said, you don't know this, but you signed a long-term uh, health, uh, long-term insurance policy. I didn't know it. She had come into my office all the time telling me to sign things. I didn't know. Mm-hmm. I just had signed apparently a long-term health agreement. So I, my income was covered and mm-hmm. substantial. Wow. So I, we didn't, my wife and I, that was, com- that was off our table. We no longer had to worry about that. And that really helped me. But now I'm still a dad. I have four children. Um, You know, that concerned me. There was a divide there. When I tell you that all I could think about was the MS, it broke me away from my kids some. I think my youngest daughter and I don't have a very, well, well, the same type of relationship I have with the others because I was thinking too much about MS. I didn't really bond with her the way I wanted to. Right. Uh, Mm -hmm. it, it It really affected me. But there came a time after eight years when my doctor finally said, look, there's a new medicine out. I want you to take it. And we talk about my wife does not hold back anything. When, when she found out that I had multiple sclerosis, she was like, we're going to find the best doctors out there. We're going to figure this out. Mm-hmm. And I had the best doctors in Miami. In fact, for the first two years after we, I retired uh, in 2005, by the end of 2005, I had already moved out to Colorado to my hometown, very small little Colorado town, because I figured if I'm going to go down, at least I've got friends I can call who can help. And yeah. my high school buddies were still there. And my mom is still there. So within six months of me retiring or, or leaving Power 96, I was out here in Colorado. So I no longer had to worry about my money because I had that covered. My kids, I was doing my best with them. Uh, my wife and I took our funds, all the money we made from the house in Miami on Don Chula's golf course. <laughs> <for the investment. laughs> um, you know, uh, we, we, then we started fixing and flipping. We started taking houses and fixing and flipping. And even though I could not stand up, I was on the ground doing grout work uh, on, mm. on the floors of these houses. And that got my wife started in the real estate business. Uh, she didn't like the way she was being treated by the real estate people that were selling us these homes. So she said, I'm going to go out and get my license. And she did. And within two years was breaking real estate records per capita in our little town in Canyon City, wow. which has then turned into her becoming an international business coach. Mm-hmm. So as I as so this whole thing, you know, at the very end of this conversation, I think I was looking over some of your notes. Uh, you wanted to know how, well, anyway, whatever. I think now that I look back, I think having MS was probably the best thing that's ever happened to me. Wow. Although it was desperate at the time when, when, when we changed the medicine eight years in and the doctor insisted I take vitamin D at at excess, uh, he believes that vitamin D is a, is a necessity for MS patients. So he changed my medicine. 
I started taking large doses of vitamin D and six months later, my condition leveled off Mm. and I stopped getting worse. Now I haven't gotten any better, but I'm not getting any worse. Uh. But then what happens now, this is where we talk about the transition. Now I've gone through, I've, I've left my job. I'm fighting this battle with the disease that might kill me. My wife and I are trying to restructure our financial lives and try to figure out our personal lives. And then suddenly it all stopped. And it was like, wait a minute. Now what? <laughs> now what? If I'm, if I'm not going to die, if my condition, I've got no more lesions, I've got nothing else diagnosed in the last, you know, since I guess 13, 14, 2014. Now what do I do? And that's when the whole thing had to, had to change because I had been angry for so long that, that I, had, I had gone through all this. I had been ripped out of the job I loved. My wife and I had to leave our wonderful home in the seventh hole of Don Shula's golf course. Uh, my, my radio career came to a screeching halt. Everything was drastic. It was terrible. And then suddenly, well, now what? So that's when I had to come up with something new. That's when I had to dig down and figure out what mattered to me. And what mattered to me was telling my story, was telling my radio career story, the excitement, the fun we had, the, the, the great stories of all the, all, the, all the crazy, nutty things I'd done. I wanted to tell the story about my diagnosis. And then I wanted to tell the story of what it's like to live with MS and that it costs to be disabled in America. So I want to I want to ask the question to you about your relationship shock of hey because I know what you're talking about with your wife and kind of getting into real estate here. But when there's a relationship shock like what happened to you is here you are the breadwinner and you're career focused and this is who you are and in looking at your role with your wife and who does what in the household. Can you talk a bit a little bit about that conversation that you had between you and her? And how did you work to recompose what each of you were going to bring to that relationship table? Because I think that's a very important part of when any of us face what you faced, right? Is this, hey, something completely shatters what we're doing on a daily basis and it can no longer be the way it was. It's going to have to be different. How did you and your wife approach that? It, it is a continuing conversation. Um, I can tell you that it is earth shattering to have everything change like it did. Uh, and it can happen to anyone uh, at any age. But, you know, we had to go all the way to the point of, you know, what can you do? What are you able to do without hurting yourself? Uh, I even tried, you know, because I, I didn't want to stop. I still wanted to mow the yard. <laughs> mm-hmm. I still wanted to take care of the kids. I still wanted to play with the dog. But after falling 50 times, I was pretty much stuck in the wheelchair. So I had to, we had to go back and reconstruct our whole life because my wife was my date at the Grammys. <laughs> mm. And then suddenly everything stopped and we had to put ourselves into a place where now what are we going to do? Um, you know, she realized that, well, we realized we needed to have some sort of income besides my insurance payout uh, because we had a future. And of course, that only lasted till I was 65. It lasted 15 years and it was going to end. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's when we, we thought that we probably ought to come up with something. And that's when she got into that real estate thing. But I, I have always wanted to be involved. And I, I think that's probably why I became a writer, because I... <laughs> I wanted to find a source of income. I wanted to at least contribute some because Mm -hmm. I really can't do anything. I mean, I can, you know, I can go to Walmart and I can be a greeter, but I can only do it for about 10 minutes before my legs start to seize out and I fall out of my chair. So there's really nothing I can do. We really had to restructure everything. Mm -hmm. And, but, but there came a point when my wife, I'm telling you, it was, I want, I even suggested I go to therapy. But my wife just simply said to me, you've got to stop being so mad about being in that wheelchair because yeah. it's not going to go away. Mm-hmm. And, and to have her, you know, now that she's a, an international business coach, she, she is deep. She gets stuff out of people. Yeah. I, I don't need a therapist. My wife said the simple thing I needed to hear. 
Stop being so mad about being there. It's not going to change. Let's figure out what you're going to do now. And I think that's really what my whole purpose is. Mm. I have to figure out how to, you know, I, I have to figure out how to cook. I have to figure out how to clean. I have to figure out how to get from, you know, the bathroom to the toilet. I, I mean, the yeah. shower to the toilet. I have to figure these things out. So every day, my life is within inches. I live within inches. If something is half an inch or an inch too far away that I'm normally used to grabbing, mm. it can make me fall out of my chair. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so we had to reevaluate everything. And, you know, and, and it hurt me. I'm telling you guys, it was, it's, it's the same thing that would happen to anybody else. If you're, you're plugging along and then suddenly you're not plugging along, mm. you get mad about it. Man. I, and, uh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. angered me for a long, long time. And like I said, it's a continuing battle because yeah. my wife still says to me, stop worrying about that. There's mm-hmm. nothing you can do about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now specifically, not that it matters, but we just purchased a 10.5 acre horse property. So I've got horses now <laughs> oh my goodness. and I've got a big John Deere tractor that I have to pull myself up on and drive around to, to, to groom the arena and stuff. So my job is to figure things out. But I can guarantee you that it was very, very low for a long, long time. Uh, it's, it was scary. Probably took me two years to then, after my, my condition leveled off, probably took me two years later to be able to say, okay, now what? Now mm-hmm. what? Mm-hmm. Now let's yeah. go do something because I was in a flux. Yeah. And, and finally, I thought, well, I'm going to go ahead and become a writer. And that's when I actually hired a writing coach and learned all about it. She taught me how to read books and those books taught me how to write. And that's where I came up with what I do now. And, and, and I think, and like I said, I think it's really the only thing I can do that I can create income with. Yeah. Plus it gets a lot of this stuff out of me. I mean, yeah. guys, you know, when you've had all these things, you know, we talk about those eight years when my condition was going down. I spent a lot of time there viewing, reviewing my life, mm. uh, how I treated people, how I worked and how I should have done things differently uh, yeah. because I got a chance to review myself because I was just sitting there for eight years waiting for it to come. So I got a chance to really go back. I'm, and so when I tell you that I think MS was the best thing that happened to me, I've, I really feel I'm a much better person now. I yeah. have much more patience with people. I'm much more sympathetic. I'm much more aware of what other people need because my life was Kid Curry, the DJ, and it was a pretty strong life, you know, and I yeah. got sucked into it. Yeah. So, so you know. Kid, I want to I wanna hone in on something before we move on um, to, to your current work and your writing. Um, so and I appreciate you going back and kind of sharing that insight, um, you know, about you and your wife and, and, you know, the roles that you had to continually learn to adopt there. Um, I want to focus on the diagnosis for a minute. And, you know, we can imagine that receiving a diagnosis like you did, right, and you said, you know, the first thing your wife said was, we're going to go find the best doctors. We're going to get ahead of this. We're going to do this. What is that journey like? And how do you find someone? I know you've talked about the advances in medicine now. So especially at that time, what's that process like finding someone that really had the right, uh, you know, recipe, if you will, to, to help with your condition and get you to that point where you are now, you know, leveled off? Well, it's, um, Finding the right people to take care of your situation is vital. Uh, Mm -hmm. And as I said, my wife has not stepped back at all trying to find the right people. In fact, I had gone to another doctor. She researched everything in this and found one doctor. And then I went there one time and she said, nope, not this one. Let's go to the next one. Mm -hmm. Um, But but what she found for me was uh, his name is Dr. Alan Bowling. Uh, Dr. Bowling writes books about multiple sclerosis and how to deal with your life and and, and uh, he believes in alternative medicines. Mm-hmm. Uh, he believes that uh, you should go ahead and go through all sorts of therapies for your MS. Um, and part of my MS, Curtis, I'm gonna admit something to you right here. And you've probably noticed it already. It's hard for me to keep a line of straight thought. So if you'll ask that question again, mm-hmm. I might answer yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so really just about the kind of the, 
the process and the journey of really finding or how did you find kind of the best doctors for you in that time? Like, what was that experience like for you? That's all my wife. Like, like yeah. I said, she was, she went, she has made sure that I've got all the best doctors. I've got all the best therapists. Hmm. Uh, but you know, I, I, I go to meetings, men over 50 with multiple sclerosis and we zoom them now. Um, hmm. And I can tell you that uh, the support system that I have is not, normal. My wife, yeah. I mean, you know, some people get diagnosed with a disease like this and the relationship falls apart. Mm -hmm. oh, for and sure. then suddenly you can be all by yourself. And I see gentlemen that I, that I see every week on my meetings or every month in the meetings that uh, are by themselves and have been abandoned by family and friends. Yeah. And so I am extremely fortunate to have a wife who has decided that uh, she will hold back nothing for my comfort. And uh, so that's the first thing you need a support team. Sure. And it's, it's not easy sometimes. I mean, she, I, in fact, that worried me in the beginning, as I mean, she's not sticking around for me, I'm falling apart. But, you know, my wife is Cuban. And that kind of changes that scenario. Mm -hmm. My yeah. wife will, she'll cut you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but that's, that's where my, my, that's how I, that's how I'm surviving the way I do. She yeah. went in, did the research and found the doctors and did the, made the phone calls because you have to be proactive guys. Yeah. You know, this, uh, you can't just take the first doctor you find. You've got to make sure they're aligned with your beliefs and with your, with your direction, because not all, not all, uh, every disease, everyone has something and it's all different. Mm -hmm. So you have to find the right people to deal with your situation. And my wife was adamant. Uh, and I've been through, you know, three or four different therapy sessions uh, with, you know, three or four different therapy places. And then finally just, she just, no, we're not going back. We're not going back. She'll find the right place. And then that's where I go. So you need to be proactive and my luck is that, that my wife is uh, adamant about making sure I, I, I suffer none. Kim, um, I, I got to I gotta jump in because it just sounds like you have the secret weapon of all secret weapons here with, with a wife who is just a persistent bulldog for you and not only just advocate for you, but also to you, right? It sounds like when, when you were kind of down in the dumps and you're angry and you're really yeah. upset about where you are in life and she's she's not, she's encouraging in a positive way of like, you need to get over yourself. You need to look at the positive and the, the life, you know, that's half full and not half empty. And I, so I want to make that observation to underline that because that's a big deal. And I don't think everybody has that. So the fact of kind of being able to go, I have a, I have a lot of me to give. And that's an important thing that if we are our last day on earth, or we are one year old or one day old that we all all have to have that. So I, I, I really kind of applaud that, but I want to ask about your book. Come get me mother. I'm through <laughs> okay. you write it costs to be disabled in America. I know you referenced that a little bit just a minute ago. Can you talk about what you mean by it costs to be disabled in America? My father um, was in the 1970s in a head on head-on collision with a tractor trailer in his little car. And he banged his knees in the dashboard. 20 years later, they ended up amputating his legs because he got, well, back then in the 80s, I don't know if you guys remember this, but there was a thing called the flesh-eating disease. They didn't know what it was. It was the flesh-eating disease. And you could over antibiotic a part of the body and it would begin to fight mm. against. Mm. So the flesh-eating disease. So my father eventually got the flesh eating disease in his knees and they amputated his legs. Now that was my first, my first dealing with anyone of any disability. Uh, and it really bothered me how people would treat him and they'd park real close to his van and uh, go into a restaurant and they would seat him off way off in the corner. It used to really bug me. And I never thought I'd ever end up in a wheelchair for God's sake. Mm -hmm. So I was like, whoa, really? But, but it really made me at, at that time, it made me more aware mm. uh, of, of how it's not easy to be disabled in the first place. So then fast forward to me mm -hmm. <laughs> ending up in a wheelchair. Now, 
you know, they give you a wheelchair in your insurance. I have one wheelchair. It's a motorized wheelchair. And I use that to get around in my house. But in order for me to get that, to go to my car, I have to have a vehicle that will take that wheelchair. It's a big motorized wheelchair. So they don't give you anything for that. If you want to take your wheelchair with you, you have to buy the lift that goes on the back of the car. And that's how you take your, or you go out and you buy another wheelchair chair, a portable wheelchair, not like the big one, but you pay for that out of your pocket. So I have the wheelchair that the insurance company gives me. And then I've got another wheelchair behind me here that I use to roll around on the third floor of my house. And I have another wheelchair in my car. That's a portable wheelchair. But if I, if I didn't, if I couldn't afford those portable wheelchairs, and if I couldn't afford a lift with my wheelchair, I couldn't go anywhere. And then mm. your insurance does not pay for that. Mm. Now, I drive. I drive with hand controls. Now, there's a great story in my book, Come Get Me Mother, I'm Through, about this crazy thing. You know, I went to go uh, be tested uh, to drive with hand controls, and nobody at the DMV knew what I was talking about. Uh, what? What do you mean, be tested for hand mm. controls? They had, I had to go to another town where they had someone who was qualified to give a hand-controlled driving test. But that person, when I went to them, they didn't know how to do it. They had to look it up. They mm. found the person that was supposed to be in charge, but because nobody ever goes, right. because it costs too much to buy hand controls, nobody ever gets tested. So it took me probably three or four trips back and forth to the DMV just to get someone to test me for hand controls. Which isn't now, easy in the first place, right? It's like, here you are with mobility issues, yes. and then they make you good do three or four trips. Oh yeah. Come back. Oh yeah. Come back. Come back. Yep. You got to come yeah. back. It's like, what, you know, just crazy. But then you have to remember that, that, that you have to learn how to use that equipment. And then you have to go find the doctor who will, uh, the doctor's office that will teach you how to do that. Once again, not covered by your insurance. Mm -hmm. You have to pay for those things. Mm -hmm. And then they get you in the car. They teach you how to do it. And then you've got to go out and buy the equipment, have that installed in your car. And all, and then you drive around before you even get tested because you have to drive the car to the DMV. Sure, right, crazy, crazy. exactly. Sure. Yeah, sure. so I'm doing it. So <laughs> it is. It is such. It's a cluster, man, and it's mm. embarrassing. And it's once again a prime example of it just costs to be disabled in America, and nobody understands unless you're in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in order to get into my home. I have a lift that gets me from the ground floor into the kitchen floor. In order for me to get into my backyard, I have another lift that gets me from the, from the kitchen floor down to the backyard. Um, it, none of that is paid for. We pay for that. And mm -hmm. once again, this is my wife deciding that her husband is not going to suffer and has me covered at every angle. But yeah. it costs to be disabled in America. Otherwise, I'd be sitting in my home veggie out and I would be doing nothing being not mm -hmm. yeah, no good for state. anybody. Yep. No yeah. good for anybody. So, yeah. so it's terrible. To, uh, uh, and so I'm a real advocate that we need to get a better healthcare system in this country. And it's embarrassing that we're the richest country on the planet and we have the worst healthcare and it's embarrassing. So, yeah. sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate all that insight. Um, so I want to keep going now with your books. I know that was a little excerpt from one of them. Um, so I just want to talk about generally, and you touched on a little bit earlier before we kind of backtracked a little bit, but what about like, can you just talk about finding your purpose now that you've retired from the radio business, right? So you've written uh, multiple books here. You've got Bonnie's Law, The Return to Fairness. You've got Come Get Me Mother, I'm Through, and The Death of Fairness. So is writing something that you've always wanted to do, or was that a pivot that you felt was obviously dealt to you? I know you talked about kind of finding ways to stay busy and, and, and kind of produce income. So can you just talk about that pivot from you know your life skills in the radio business to now being a, an author? Well, first of all, I, I was really adamant about telling my story in the first place because yeah. it, when I really didn't care to until I decided that people needed to read about my disability and how it's cost, how it costs to be disabled in America. So that got me started uh, in, into writing. But, you know, along that process, I'm a longtime radio broadcaster. Uh, my dad got me started in 1972. And so my dad and I have this real radio relationship, or we had, he's passed now. Uh, 
but we had a real close relationship when it came to broadcasting. I, you know, so I go out of my radio career and I'm going off to the big times to Miami and, uh, you know, Washington, D.C. And I'd come home on vacation and my father would complain that all the friends he had at the radio station, it was only one radio station in my hometown, all his friends were being fired and they were being replaced by these syndicated talk shows. Mm -hmm. And he believed those talk shows were negative and they were causing the town to fight. They were causing neighbors to not like neighbors. And I would come home and I wouldn't, I didn't think much about it. You know, I, oh, well, you know, dad, that's just what happens in broadcasting. You know, you know, just that's the new thing. It's syndication. That's just what happens. But mm -hmm. it, it really affected my father. And he didn't like the way that the radio station in itself, by itself, because of the ownership's decision to play these particular shows affected the town because everybody was listening to all of the propaganda being spewed mm -hmm. and believing it. And it made, he thought, the town very negative. Well, that story is always kind of stuck in my head. And there's a reason for that. It happened because in 1987, President Reagan vetoed the Fairness and Broadcasting Act. Now, that act included the Fairness Doctrine. Now, that doctrine simply stated equal time for contrasting points of view. In other words, if you get on the radio or television in America and you lie, anybody, any citizen has the right to go to that TV station or that radio station and demand equal time to prove or dispel the lie. Equal time for contrasting points of view. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you lose that rule, all you have now are pundits spewing lies without debate. And that really has always stuck in my head. I've yeah. never liked it. I've always thought that because I'm a radio guy, I wanted ratings just like Rush Limbaugh. We mm -hmm. all knew that we, we are ratings guys. So my way of getting ratings was to come up with creative radio contests and bits and talk to people and be very community oriented. Well, Mr. Limbaugh's idea and I remember it distinctly back in 1987, listening to the radio one day thinking, this guy's lying and people are sucking it up because mm -hmm. they don't know the truth and they believe this guy and it's not going to be good. And I believe that the decision by Ronald Reagan in 1987 to take out the fairness doctrine has really affected the society that we live in today. We're very divided. We've always been divided. But when someone can spew lies and disinformation over and over without any, dis any dispute, mm. it's caused a problem in our country. So that's where I wrote the book, The Death of Fairness. Mm, that's kind yeah. of the adult. That's the first idea I had. That was because I kind of told that story in reference to my father. It was kind of like my dad was helping me tell that story. But you know what I did? I took that book and I sent it to a company called Tail Flick. Now, Tail Flick reads books and they go through and think, well, is there any possibility of this being a movie? Hmm. So they write me back after reading my book and they think, hey, this is a good idea. We don't talk about this in America. We need to. And but it's not deep enough. You need to create more characters, more plot line, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. So that was where I had the idea to rearrange the book into Bonnie's Law, The Return to Fairness. That's the third book. Now, what the reason I wrote that is because I really believe and I'm hoping that some way, someday, some little kid picks up my book, Bonnie's Law, The Return to Fairness, reads it and understands that we could go back to the days of the fairness doctrine because it's just legislation. Mm -hmm. But every time the fairness doctrine comes up in Washington, D.C., one particular party who has benefited from lies and disinformation squelches the, answer, the, the, the conversation. Mm -hmm. So if there were enough people in the houses of Congress who believed in truth <laughs> and the return to fairness, you could bring back the fairness doctrine. So I'm hoping because it's not going to be anybody our age. I mean, well, you guys are much younger than me, my age, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, it's going to take young people, young people to fix this, these things we have in this country that continually uh, I'm on the planet 66 years. We've been rolling the same dice for a long time, guys. Yeah, yeah. We sure, need yeah. to come up with a better hand. Yep. This is ridiculous. And I believe it's only going to be the young people of America that are going to do it. And 
I'm hoping that some young person reads Bonnie's law and says, Hey, I could go do that. Okay, so because plug, you can. plug for every all the listeners out there, right? That's right. Hand hand Bonnie's law to uh, to some of the the younger members of your family, and let's let's try to get that going. As a matter um, of fact, today I got a phone call from a pro- professor friend of mine in New York mm-hmm. City who just finished the book, and she's going to recommend it to the school's library. Nice. Awesome. So it's it's caught on, and and you know, again, with any luck, some little kid will go. Wait a minute, we can go do this. Again. Mm-hmm. Because wouldn't that be nice? You know, if we could just, if you could just debate the lie, mm-hmm. that's all. Mm-hmm. We don't want to, so Reagan's idea was that it, it, that the fairness doctrine took what was the opposite of the first amendment. You should be able to say whatever you want to say. Well, you should be able to say whatever you want to say, but if you're lying, I should be able to say you're lying and yeah. here's why. Yeah. Okay. So that's all. I'm sorry. As you can see, it's my thing. Yeah, I, I, hey, well, that, that, I think that's that's what we wanted to get out of you today, Kim, is, you know, is to find, hey, that there's things in our lives that we're very passionate about. And even if we, in the form of which our purpose currently lies, doesn't mean that that's what it always has to be, that, the, that there's things in our values and the things that we're passionate about. There's, there's a lot of ways we can make impacts. There's a lot of ways we can continue to um, impress upon people our ideas and our thoughts. And, and I, I think that that's really, I think, the biggest part. So that's what I want to ask to you is what advice would you give someone that is going through a sudden retirement due to change in their health, right? Think back to you in that moment. If you were sitting here today and you're able to give that uh, advice to yourself, maybe the day two after getting the news and the diagnosis that you did, what would you, what would you give for advice? I'm going to say the same thing that my father used to tell me that it took me a long time to hear it again but it's the truth. It ain't what happens to you. It's what you do about it because everybody's got it. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got something. So regardless of what happens, what are you going to do? And that's where I lead. That's where I live my life now. Um, Because what am I going to do to be able to get on the tractor? Because I've got to go out and groom the arena. You know, it's, it's not what happened to you. What are you going to do about it? Well, now I've got to figure out how to get on the zero turn lawnmower. Believe me, if OSHA saw me doing it, they wouldn't let me do it. (laughs) So so what are you going to do about it? So if something happens to you and it happens to everyone, yes, the shock is, is, is hard to get over at times. It takes years for focus to come back, but remember it ain't what happens to you. It's what you're going to do about it. And everybody has within themselves the power to have those answers. If you just mm-hmm. quiet your mind long enough, mm-hmm. you will find an answer. And hopefully you can have people around you who encourage you to do the things that you want, that will help you strive for your peace. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I'm fortunate, man. My wife is, is uh, my biggest advocate and I've got it. And I know a lot of people don't, but yeah you know, we can only hope and yeah. you, and I hope that people who are hearing this right now will understand that, you know, it is tough, but it ain't what happens to you. It's what you do about it. So I like that. I like appreciate that. Yeah. I like that a lot. Um, so we've reached kind of the end of our show here. I have a final question for you. Um, I'm actually going to audible a little bit. I don't know if Ben knows where I'm going with this, but it's actually a two-part question because you teased something in the beginning of, I think it was even before we came on air that I really want the answer to that we didn't (laughs) ask in the beginning. So um, obviously the name of our show is the Retirement Success in Maine podcast. So I have two questions for you. One, and I'll start with the first one, which is the first part of our title, is retirement success. So how will you define your retirement success as you continue to live through it? I am in a place now in my life that I never thought I would be. Uh, my encouragement to my wife for her to step ahead, take the things that she wants to do and do them the way she wants to do them has been really a major factor in how well I'm doing right now. Yeah, My wife is doing extremely well in this thing that she 
She's now an international business coach. She works for Keller Williams. She's a, a, she's really um, in tune, got like 40 clients around the world right now that she talks to once a week. Uh, so that, and me being able to push her on has, has, she has surpassed anything I imagine. First of all, when I met her, she was working uh, for financial advisors and before that was already working uh, for fam in family law. Mm. So I knew she was smart in the first place, yeah. but to run the Kid Curry show, she used to call it, it's the Kid Curry show and it's hard. Uh, so she used <laughs> to have to run my, my, my appointments, my shows, I had appearances. She ran all that. And then that all shifted. Yeah. And when she took over, when she finally got to do what she wanted to do, she has surpassed anything I would ever imagine. And that's why now I'm on a 10 and a half acre horse ranch. That's um, incredible. So my success is my wife's success. Me being able to push her mm -hmm. and let her know that no matter what, I know you can do this, yeah. has put us in a place that I could never imagine. And wow. uh, I am very pleased. Again, have an MS was probably a pretty good thing for me. Yeah. So. No, I love that. That's a great answer. And so now the, my second question here is the second part of our show name, and it has to do with the state of Maine. So I know you teased this again, off air to us. So I want to ask, do you have any connections to the state of Maine? I know you said you're in Colorado right now. So I just wanted to turn that over for you. Two. Um, okay. My father, of course, like I said, was a Navy veteran. We were, yep. he was stationed in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, and Virginia Beach, Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had, we had the, he, he used to call him uncle and uncle Ray and aunt Ellie. Okay. I don't know if they were real aunt <laughs> and, and, and uncle. I don't know that, but I remember that he would take us up to Bangor, or up to Maine, wherever it was on the coast there. Yeah. And we would stay in these people's house. They lived right on the ocean okay. and we would have, they would dig a hole in the sand and we would have crab boils or boils and they mm -hmm. would boil mm -hmm. seafood right yeah, there with, yeah, with uh, yeah, lobster yeah. and stuff like that. And I was probably three or four years old and man, <laughs> it was cool. And it was, <laughs> I never forget it. I mean, it's like everything I ever thought you could ever do and have fun, have a lobster up in Maine. So there you go. Now my other connection, I'm 17 years old. And as I said, I was a high school trumpet player and I wasn't the best, but I was pretty good. And I was in an, uh, an all region uh, high school band that traveled over to Europe at 17 okay. years old in 1972. And um, we, we flew out of Bangor. So, yeah. so we flew mm. from, from here, from Denver out to Bangor before we took off over to Europe. Mm -hmm. yeah. and the interesting now on the way back. Now, remember, I'm 17. It's 1972. We stayed in a town that had no they only had toilets in the homes. They didn't have any other running water. So okay. I, we stayed in a town in Germany that had, uh, th there was a stream that went through town and they bordered the bottom of it. And that's where everybody took their baths mm. was in the stream. So mm. you'd be, I mean, it was mountain cold water and, and people were just bathing in the, and it was just crazy. So, and then we visited Dachau prison camp. Uh, I, I played at Birch's garden. But when we come back from there, now I've been about a month in Europe, I come back, we land back in Bangor, and there's a picture on the front page of my hometown newspaper of me kissing the ground to be back <laughs> in Bangor, Maine. And that's the picture that they took that ended up on the front page of my, of, of my hometown newspaper. So that's incredible. I love that. Well, my, my big banger moment. So. All right. Well, you, you, have, you have a pretty good relationship with the state of Maine. Yeah. If, yeah. I love it. Awesome. Well, Kim, thank you so much for coming on our show. I, you know, I, I, I just applaud everything that you're about, mm -hmm. um, you know, your attitude, your resilience, you know, uh, just even hearing about the relationship with your, with your wife and the, the, the teamwork that you guys have and the, you know, in working to do all the things that you've done together. I think that's why you were successful before. And also why she's successful now is, yeah. is be, you, you have each other's back. And I think that's when we work with our clients, that's, that, those are the types of things that we look to see as a very strong bonds. So I really think you shared a lot with us today about retirement yeah. success, about finding your own um, uh, success and reinventing yourself as something happens. So thank you so much. We will yeah. share um, a lot of uh, your links uh, in our show. We'll talk about that in our wrap up, but thank you so much for coming on today. Gentlemen, I really enjoyed the conversation today and I, and I hope we uh, touched somebody somewhere along the line. 
And uh, you guys be well. And thanks again for your time. I appreciate right. it. Very much. Sure, okay. So when you have a moniker like Kid Curry, <laughs> you gotta be you gotta be like a radio guy, right? So gotta be you good. Gotta um, be. Good to hear from Kim about again, kind of the uh, the career path and yeah. sudden health issue and. And man, that sounds uh, pretty scary as something just to kind of go through. And I know, I know there's enough of us that know people that have MS or, right. um, and it's affected people in lots of different ways. So uh, yeah. again, I, I think it was really great to hear Kim's vulnerability and kind of where he was and, but also just want to highlight the importance of a few things. One is advocating for your health, sure. right. And going and checking and when something's not right yeah. is going to well, take and a he, look. He talked about dismissing those symptoms. His mom told him to go get checked and he said, what are you talking yep. about? I'm fine. So yeah, a hundred percent. So advocate advocacy is a big deal Two is I think support groups around you, right. Is your, Absolutely. your wife and your family and your friends and, making sure that they know what you're going through and um, allowing them to be supportive. And because I hearing from his story initially is he's angry about where he is and what, what right. happened to him. And, and it was even, even kind of harm some of his kids relationships, which I think is, it's probably yeah. one of the last things we all want to do Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when, when that's happening. So I think there's, there's some really good lessons that he shared with us today. Um, again, kind of a, uh, I, I know as a radio guy, kind of uh, interesting to hear some of the storytelling and a lot of the things that were that had happened to him as well. Yeah. But I know um, we would appreciate you checking out some of Kim's books as well. Yeah. So we'll have links to them uh, on Amazon to check out. Uh, so I know he'd appreciate that as well. So we'll have links there. You can go to our website uh, for this uh, podcast. So it's blog.guidancepointllc.com backslash six nine because we're episode 69 right. and you can check out more of our episode and show notes and um you know a uh, transcription things like that will all be there for you to check out so really appreciate you tuning in on behalf of curtis myself and our guidance point team thanks so much for uh checking out our podcast and we'll catch you next time